Okay, so one of the most common questions I get is how do I become one of these top 1% software engineers? How do I become one of those software engineers who gets promoted super quickly, who makes a lot of money, who lands all of the different jobs? How do you become these just super good software engineers? What are they doing differently? So in this video, we're going to look at a few different articles and blog posts about what exactly some of these things are that you can be doing to become one of these people, regardless of if you're very early on in your career or maybe you're more senior. So for those who are more early on starting out, one of the most important important things is to improve at problem solving. And I know this sounds very generic and high level, but it's actually very specific. And it's something that I've noticed in myself, as well as anecdotally in a lot of other people that we actually tend to think we're very good at, but oftentimes we're actually not that good at it. So in this article, sort of what it talks about is that the first thing you need to do is actually clarify the problem. And this is something I've noticed a lot as well. Oftentimes somebody will come to me and they're trying to get advice on something. They're trying to get help with solving some problem. And I always say sort of step back for a second. What exactly is it that you're even trying to do? What is the end goal here? And sometimes people can't fully articulate that. So make sure that before you do anything that you actually figure out what is the end goal? What exactly is it that you're trying to solve? Because if you can't do that, then you don't know if you're making progress. You don't know if you're actually solving the right problem and just nothing is going to be working. And then once you know exactly what that problem is that you're trying to solve, make sure that you have actionable steps to actually solve it. You can't just say, okay, this is the problem. Now I'm going to go solve that problem. You need to break it down into much smaller problems that you can tackle one at a time. And this will allow you to just sort of inch closer to that goal rather than being overwhelmed and trying to do it all at once. And also recognize that there are going to be blockers. So nothing is going to be linear. You aren't going to be able to just start with some problem and then break it down and then solve it step by step and be done. Most of the time, that isn't what happens. With each of these smaller steps that you do, oftentimes you'll run into some blockers. Something's not going to work. You're going to realize that maybe one of the steps needs to change, something like this, and just be okay with that. Be willing to actually adapt and recognize what the best ways are to actually unblock yourself. For example, if you have some problem that you're trying to solve and it's going to take you a few hours to figure it out, but you know that there's somebody right down the hall that you can just ask the question to and they can give you the answer in 30 seconds, don't be afraid to go ask that question. Of course, before you do this, try to solve the problem on your own, but don't get stuck for hours and hours trying to solve some problem and get past some blocker when there's somebody who can unblock you pretty much instantly. And you also want to get better at other ways to unblock yourself, whether this be getting better at reading documentation or finding solutions online, all of these different strategies that you can be using to unblock yourself become very important in becoming a super effective software engineer. Additionally, another thing that this article talks about is brainstorming. And this is something that's also very important and sort of overlooked a lot of times. So in the context of brainstorming, it means laying out the relevant cards, considering the options that are available to you, and then filtering down to the next best action step. Additionally, it's also important to consider the cost for implementing solutions as every action requires a risk assessment. And I think this is super important and something that a lot of people overlook. You can't just think of the first solution that comes to mind and go do that thing. That's not going to be a very good way to be a productive software engineer. Instead, you need to think about all of the different options for solving some problem and then assess them against each other. Figure out which one is going to be higher risk, which one is going to take more time, which one might be better in the long run, right? What are the sort of trade-offs between all of them? And then you can use those trade-offs to make good informed decisions. Another important thing is to make sure that you're building habits and finding a way to constantly learn. And one of the best ways I found to do this is actually with today's sponsor, daily.dev. So daily.dev is an extension for your browser or you can just use it on a website. And essentially what it is, is just a feed that is customized to you and what you're interested in that helps you stay up to date with different topics and see sort of trending things in whatever areas of tech that you are actually interested in. So this is my feed here and you'll see I get sort of a variety of content about different things that are interesting to me. So for example, we have some content about CSS variables. It looks like this is more of a tutorial and then something about some new CSS media query syntax an open source React UI avatar library. So this is going to be something about some library. This is just a good way to sort of stay up to date on different things, read different blog posts about different opinions people have about tech. So for example, let's click on this five cool Chrome dev tool features that most developers don't know about. TLDR discover five lesser known features of Chrome dev tools that can greatly boost development efficiency. And there's this whole TLDR here. You can read all the comments and sort of interact with the daily dev community. Or if it's super interesting to you, you can actually go ahead and read the full article. This one is on Medium, and I could read this and learn about these 
different Chrome DevTool features. So really I think it's about habit building and finding a habit that's going to allow you to be continually growing. And I think daily.dev is a great way to do that. So if you are interested in trying it out, it's completely free and there'll be a link at the top of the description. Another interesting idea comes from this very famous talk by Tanya Riley about the idea of being sort of a glue person or doing glue work and how glue work differs from what she calls promotable work. So glue work is sort of like grunt work. It's work that needs to be done for the team to be productive, but oftentimes isn't really main projects. It's not big things. So because of that, it doesn't really get tracked all that well. So these are going to be things like answering client questions, or maybe it can be something like reviewing somebody's system design or reviewing somebody's code. These are all important things that need to be done. However, doing them oftentimes doesn't really give you much sort of credit, if you will, towards getting that promotion. On the other hand, promotable work is going to be work that's very easy to track. This is all of the code that you're actually outputting. It's the products that you're actually shipping. These are things that you can, at review time, say, hey, look, these are the things I did. I did this, 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 and this, and all of these things are affecting the bottom line. They're affecting our customers. This is great. Everything's amazing. I should be promoted. But if the things that you did were all sort of these glue things where it's like, oh, I helped this person on this, I helped this person on this, I helped this person on this. That doesn't necessarily tell a full story. It can in some circumstances and with very good management that can actually be something that can lead to promotions, but oftentimes it just doesn't because they're looking for these large projects that are being shipped, which oftentimes if you're doing too much of this glue work, you're not doing. And this is a slide from that talk that I think is very important. So if you're one of these people who does all of this glue work, your schedule might end up looking something like this, where you just have meeting after meeting after meeting, where you're having all of these different one-on-ones with all of these different people. You're in basically every meeting ever. And because of that, you have no time to work on your own sort of individual contributor work. And because of that, most likely you just won't be getting those promotions. Even if you are the person who is most important of anybody on your entire team, you're just not really doing the things that are aligned with how you actually get promoted at most tech companies. And in particular, this applies the most to more junior developers, because as you become more senior, these sort of glue tasks actually become more important to what you're doing because you're sort of a lead for the team and that's what's expected of you. But for more junior developers, the most important thing towards your own career progression is going to be the things you're actually shipping yourself. Now, this doesn't mean to do none of this glue work. You probably should be doing some of it. You should sort of be contributing to the team in this way. And especially as you get promoted more, you're going to be doing more and more of it. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to you should be you. And you should focus the most on your own career progression and doing the things that are going to help yourself, even if ultimately that means that you might not actually be doing the best work for the team. I know it's sort of a weird thing to say that, oh, you might want to do something that's not the best thing for the team, but if you are going to put yourself first, which ultimately I think you probably should be putting yourself first, that is likely going to be the reality that you're going to be sort of balancing the trade-offs between what's best for the team in the long run and what's best for your own promotions and your own sort of career progression. And also, if you really enjoy this glue work and you are doing a lot of it, just make sure you're having clear conversations with your manager to say, hey, these are the things I'm doing. This is the work I'm doing. This is why it's so important. Can you sort of make sure that this is on track for what my goals actually are. And even if that's not you, you should still be having these conversations. I think one of the most important things to be doing is to be very clear with your manager to say, hey, these are the things I'm doing. These are my goals. Do you think these things are aligned? If say your goal is I want to be promoted at the end of the year, make sure that they know that and make sure that they are giving you tasks to do that sort of align with that and make sure that they are sort of checking in with you and making sure that you are following the path to achieve those goals. For instance, when I was at Meta in my second half, I wanted to get my first promotion. And I was very clear with my manager about this from the very beginning of that half. And he helped me pick out tasks and projects to work on that he thought would help for that promotion down the line. And ultimately I was able to get that promotion. And I think had I never been clear about that from the beginning, I likely wouldn't have gotten that promotion at the end of that half. And it probably would have taken another six months just because I wouldn't have been doing optimal work towards working towards my own career progression and that promotion. And with all of this work you do, one of the most important things that a lot of people overlook, and I certainly did early on, is the importance of promoting your work meaning the importance of just letting people know about it. So Ryan Peterman talks about this in this blog post, and he has this quote, your work can't be recognized unless people know about it. And this is so true. If you don't tell anybody about the work you did, does that work even exist? I don't know, probably not. Not in the sense of actually getting promotions and all of these things. And it's not to say that that's like the most important thing and that you should spend all of your time basically being like an influencer inside of your company and making sure everybody knows every little thing you do. 
but you should make sure to actually share the work you're doing with different people. So he talks about tagging different people and sort of having this org highlight process, but really just make sure that relevant stakeholders for your projects know about your projects. And most importantly, make sure that your manager is always included on things. Make sure your manager knows about all of the different work you're doing because they are ultimately the most important person towards getting those promotions. And if they don't know about the work you're doing, then there's no way for them to sort of be giving you that credit for it. And another thing you can be doing to sort of constantly learn and sort of improve your understanding of software development as a whole is to read different engineering blogs from different companies. So one thing some people don't know is that most major tech companies have these big engineering blogs where they talk about these big system design challenges that they're facing and things like that. For example, this is engineering at Meta and they have a ton of different interesting posts you can read about. And I would recommend actually reading some of these. And like I said, almost every single major tech company has this. So it doesn't have to be Meta that you read. Whatever tech companies you are interested in, maybe read their engineering blogs. Just choose two or three or maybe go back and forth between all of them. There are a ton out there. But just one thing I would recommend doing is sort of reading through these from time to time just to learn more about the major challenges that these companies are facing at the massive scale that they have. Another important point to growth as a software engineer is how to choose what exactly you work on and specifically how to choose to work on things that actually matter and have high impact. So this is from the staff engineering blog. And if we come down here, they have this image I think is really good where it says avoid snacking. So you can think of sort of these four quadrants of work you can do. You can do low effort, high impact work, low effort, low impact work, high effort, low impact work, or high effort, high impact work. And you might be saying, okay, I want to minimize effort and maximize impact. So I just want to do low effort, high impact work. And they sort of call this snacking of just doing only that type of work, but eventually that work is going to run out. So you do want to do some of this because this type of work can allow you to have a lot of impact very easily. But all of the other quadrants are also important, specifically the two at the top. So high effort, high impact work is also going to be important. This high effort, high impact work allows you again to have high impact, which of course is very important, but also by being higher effort, that is something you can actually show in your performance reviews. Like look at all of this work I put into this one really big thing. Additionally, doing these harder projects are the things that allow you to learn new things and to continue growing as an engineer. And you just get better and better at actually doing software engineering. Whereas if you just do all of this easy stuff all of the time, you're not going to be actually getting better at software engineering. You might be finishing tasks, but you'll sort of just plateau as a developer. So really what I would say is try to find some of these low effort, high impact things you can do just because high impact is always a good thing, but then have a few of these high effort, high impact projects that you're always working on to make sure you're growing as an engineer and having a lot of impact. And then of course, from time to time, you will still be doing some work that's lower impact, but just try to minimize that as much as you can because of course, lower impact work is less important. And this also sort of connects to this idea from another Ryan Peterman post about finding next level scope. So as you're trying to get promoted, oftentimes what companies are looking for is that you are doing work at that next level already. So if you are a mid-level developer and you want to become a senior developer, oftentimes what they're looking for is that you are doing senior developer work already. Maybe you're maintaining that for six months or a year or something like that, but that's usually how the criteria is actually written. So you want to find ways to get to that next level and scope. And essentially he talks about just that. There's two high level steps to getting promoted. The first is finding next level scope. And the second is solving problems and landing impact. So find problems that require you to demonstrate the behaviors of the next level. And then once you find those problems that are big enough, you need to deliver with high quality. And if you're a new grad or even a mid-level developer, this actually can be pretty easy because it tends to be something you can actually just sort of ask your manager for. You can say, hey, I'm trying to work towards this promotion. Can you help me find work that's a little bit higher scoped? And they can usually help you do that. And then as you get more senior, it actually can become more difficult because they're just less of these senior and staff level projects to go around. So it's sort of more of an effort to find these high scoped projects that you can be working on. But of course it is possible. And specifically Ryan, who is somebody at Meta who got promoted very, very quickly, talks about this as basically the idea of brainstorming project ideas with engineers who are one or two levels higher than you are. And this is such a good idea because one, they just understand what you need for those higher scoped projects, 
but also these people probably have a lot on their plate. There's a lot of projects they're considering, and there's probably some that they're not going to be doing because they're not quite enough scope for them or they just have too much on their plate. But those projects that they're not going to be doing might still be a large enough scope for you to do to be working towards that promotion. So if they're two levels higher than you, they might have a project that's sort of in between your current level and their current level, and they can give that to you as a project that you can work on for that higher scope, whereas they're going to work on something that's even higher scoped than that. And this one, he talks about the idea that if you get these projects from these people, then they're naturally going to be somebody who helps you with those projects and they can sort of become a mentor to you, which is something that's very important when you're trying to move up the ranks is to have this mentorship and have people that you can ask questions to. Now, one more post from Ryan. If you can't tell, I really like his blog, highly recommend it. I have no connection to it in any way, just something I like a lot, but it is why I switched teams. And I think this is a really important point. So he was on the same team, Instagram media infrastructure for, I think he says six years. And then he finally switched teams to an AI and ML training infrastructure team. And this is all within Meta. And I think what's important here is not just about the idea of switching teams, but the idea of sort of moving on from anything, whether it be your team or your org or your entire company. And I think a lot of people sort of stagnate too much because they get comfortable. And then sort of with that comfortability comes this idea of, well, why would I want to switch teams or switch companies? Because that's going to make me uncomfortable. But unfortunately, that uncomfortability is the thing that oftentimes leads to the most growth. So once you get to a point where you feel like you're not growing anymore, now might be a good time to consider either switching teams or switching companies. And he goes on to talk about this idea of a rising tide lifts all boats, which simply means that if you go to places where it's naturally high impact, there's going to be more impact for you to have, which means that you can grow more and you can sort of progress in your career more. So for example, he switched to this team in the AI space and AI is obviously this super hot topic right now. So it makes sense that that is a team that could potentially lead to a lot of opportunities down the road. That said, I do think this gets overstated sometimes. And I think it's important to note that he stayed on the same team for six years because they gave him tons of opportunity and he got to do a lot of interesting work with talented people. So he was able to rise the ranks within Meta without changing teams and without ever leaving the company. So essentially my point is just that you don't need to be job hopping every one to two years and you don't need to be switching teams every year or anything like that. But if you do find that your current team and job are not allowing you to grow, then it might be time to move on, whether that be five or 10 years down the line or whether that be after just a year. Now, another important thing about these top 1% developers is they write very clean code. And for that, you should watch this video next on 10 clean code principles that I think are super important.